<laughs> I'm so excited to be here with you this evening because this is such an important topic. You know, some of our children don't know that they can heal. It's not a lifelong sentence of mental illness when they have reactive attachment disorder. Their heart can heal. The brain can heal. Their life can heal. You know, I, I often share the stories of my own children, my Beth, my beautiful Beth, who came to me so sick. You know, um, she was in an HBO special called Child of Rage, and it's on YouTube if you ever want to see it. She was a very sick little girl, and now she's a beautiful woman, phenomenal. She was nurse of the year for the entire western region of the United States because of her heart. She's just an amazing young woman. Um, my son Adam came to me at 12, very sick, very twisted little boy, and now he's a wonderful young man. He's in New York um, going to college and studying, and his faith is so strong. He reads his Bible every morning in Hebrew, <laughs> all right? So, the Old Testament. Um, our kids can heal, but you know, I often share the stories of my children, even my Connie, from where she was at 15, the violence and all that, to where she is now, a wonderful young mother, and um, you know, she's 22 in California there, and just really doing amazingly well. But I wanted to share with you stories of other children, because a lot of times people think, oh, well, Nancy Thomas did it. You know? So I asked some of the amazing parents out there whose children are now healthy, who start out very, very sick, to share the stories of their children and what they did that worked for them. So I've got 12 children's stories here to share with you so that you know your child can heal and your child knows they can heal. And this program works. There are thousands of children out there, not only in the United States, but in Canada, throughout the world, England, Australia, India, um, that are healthy now who started out very, very sick and twisted, and they found the help they needed to have. So I know it's a long, tough road. <laughs> long, tough road. But it is worth it. All right, so I want to start with an amazing little girl named Bethany. There she is before. And as you're looking at the pictures of the children, I want you to focus on their eyes. You see her jaw is set a lot of tension there in anger but you look in her eyes and they're cold yes but they're also blank and there's a layer of fear underneath that that we consistently see with our children all right so Bethany's mom writes we used to describe Bethany as a toddler with colic because she screams so much in fact her incessant screaming and tantrums caused so much tension and chaos in her home that our kind, loving golden retriever ended up traumatized and hiding behind our upstairs toilet whenever she heard a child cry anywhere, even on the television. It was so incessant that when I tried to hug my husband or tried to interact with her sister, Bethany would throw herself on the floor in a mass of toddler rage. At one point when we were in our first therapist's office, she slammed her head against my chest. And when I put her down to protect myself, she turned and reached up to me while screaming for me to pick her up. Now this first story, the mom has shared a lot of in-depth um, things. And I asked parents to just give me a couple of paragraphs. And this one's quite long. But it's so important because she really shares the feelings that many of us feel as parents the confusion okay she just hit me and hurt me and I put her down to protect myself and now she wants me to pick her up to comfort her when she's the one who hurt me I mean it doesn't make any sense and we're in the middle of it trying to sort it out pretty much nonstop. Bethany was very controlling sound familiar um, everything had to be her way or she protested she wanted me to hold her certain ways she did not reciprocate in holding on to me when I held her her arms hung by her sides. She wanted me to carry her everywhere and she would scream if I walked from one room to another, even if she could still see me. I felt more like her puppet than her mother, but until we got a diagnosis four years later, I couldn't put my finger on just what I was feeling. I just knew it didn't feel good being her mom. Her dad remembers her as having a very cold and distant look in her eyes, especially toward him. Bethany didn't play. When I tried to play peekaboo with her, she would either stare at me or cry. 
When I would smile over at her, she would just stare back. When trying to play with her with finger paints or other typical fun kid activities, she was either not interested or she fussed and cried. If she dropped something or spilled something, she melted into a screaming pile and I was unable to console her. There were a few times where Bethany reached for others or ran from me when I went to retrieve her from the church nursery. We felt what that feels like. Although it appeared that Bethany was able to hug to the outside world, when she did come to me for hugs at the last moment, she would pivot and give me her back. See the pain and the fear in those eyes and the set jaw? Although Bethany used me as her puppet mom, she absolutely hated her dad. She looked at him with complete disdain. She would not interact with him and instead looked through him with cold, blank eyes. If I tried to go out, she would sabotage by hassling her dad or trying to triangulate between us. Parenting Bethany really impacted our marriage in negative ways. We started bickering more frequently. This happens often when we have an emotionally disturbed child in our home. She had a love-hate relationship with her sister Kendall. She wanted her around when she wanted her so she had someone to play with. But when it came time for me to give Kendall attention, Bethany would sabotage it through tantrums, interrupting, breaking things, hassling, or other behaviors designed to undermine my connection to Kendall. One day Kendall's guinea pig died and Bethany said to me, good, now Kendall has more time to spend with me while Kendall was grieving. The most disturbing behavior Bethany displayed was self-mutilation and violence against her, herself, and me, her mother. At night, Bethany would scratch herself until she had open sores, or she would peel the skin off her lips until they bled. She would bite, headbutt, pull hair, kick, and growl. She had so many night terrors that between her third birthday and her fourth, I can count the number of times she did not wake up screaming on one hand. That means we had a real tired mom here. When I finally came across the checklist for infant toddler rad, reactive attachment disorder, she pretty much had every one of them. Within a month of returning home, we went to a social worker that quote unquote specialized in adoption. She told us we just all needed time to adjust. Does this person specialize in adoption? No. She doesn't know what she's talking about. The next social worker was also a quote unquote adoption specialist and an adoptive mom to a Chinese adoptee. She told us that Bethany had learned to control her environment through screaming and we needed to put baby gates up so Bethany could see me but then just let her scream so she learned she couldn't be the boss of me. This was a social worker that witnessed Bethany slamming her head against my chest in her office. We don't leave them alone to scream. The next professional we visited was a family therapist since the stress was starting to impact my marriage. The family therapist was trained in love and logic but not trained in reactive attachment disorder or PTSD. And Love and Logic is an outstanding program that we highly, highly recommend. However, it does not work when our children are severely emotionally disturbed. We have to get them stable first, and then we can move on to the Love and Logic program, which then can be very, very effective. All right? So, where do we get to here? Oh, the therapist assured us we were great parents and love it. Um, Bethany was a complete delight illustrated by how engaging and smiley she was in his office. She's manipulating the therapist. She was simply charming and we were going to be just fine. We just needed to relax. So implying it's the parent's tension. All right. Then we went to a therapist who was trained in reactive attachment disorder who immediately had Bethany's number and was the only person to elicit Bethany's rage. He was fine for the reactive attachment disorder, but he didn't have the skills he needed to help Bethany with dealing with her trauma background. At four years old, Bethany told her sister she hated herself and wished she were dead. I had already been searching for answers. Finally, one day while talking to my cousin who had adopted twin boys, and she was certain her boys also had RAD from the symptoms, my cousin and I began to share notes and I started to suspect RAD for Bethany as well. I borrowed Nancy Thomas's DVD series, Mastering Steps, and stayed up all night watching them. At the end, I knew what we were dealing with. It was RAD. 
I started Googling RAD and Chinese adoptees and found Attach China. Attach China led me to Attach Oregon, which led me to Bethany's amazing attachment trauma therapist, Dr. Colleen Miller. We started seeing Dr. Miller every other week. We knew that Dr. Miller was the one, and we would have to see her regularly to help Bethany and our family, but she was 800 miles away, and that was a plane trip, okay? An entire day's plane trip away from the rest of the family. We couldn't afford the cost of travel every two weeks like that. We couldn't afford renting a car for the drive to and from the 90-minute appointment, but we sure couldn't afford to continue living like we were either. My husband and I decided that we would give Bethany's therapies all the resources and all the time we could for two years and then reevaluate where we were at the end of those two years. We had Bethany evaluated by Northwest Neurodevelopmental Training Center and um, get her into a neuro reorganizational brain program. This was to help rewire healthier neural pathways and allow Bethany's brain to repair itself and heal from the early childhood trauma. She did these therapies for 26 months. I found Karen Purvis's material at Texas Christian University, especially the article called Finding the Real Child. Inside this article, I discovered the use of supplements in treating neurotransmitter imbalances found within adopted children, especially those with RAD. They were calling the intervention Targeted Amino Acid Therapy, or TAAT. I searched until I found a lab that could test Bethany's neurotransmitter levels. That's your serotonin and dopamine in those, okay? We sent in her first urine test, and the results were staggering. Our practitioner, Pam, called me on Friday and told me that she was sending a box of supplements overnight mail because she was concerned if we didn't get Bethany's brain in balance, Bethany had a high risk for permanent mental illness. Furthermore, Pam said Bethany's brain was so amped up, it was as if Bethany had consumed 40 cups of coffee. And no wonder we were seeing daily violent rages. Just like a shaken soda can, her brain had to let off steam in order to reset itself each day. We started the supplements, and within two weeks, Bethany slept through the night for the first time since we had adopted her five years earlier. To this day, she still takes supplements, but the protocol has changed and will most likely continue to change over the years. Bethany's brain is now beautifully balanced and healthy. After graduating from neurological reorganization, these are the crawling exercises and there's certain physical movements that the therapists have the children do to activate different neurons and or cables between the neurons, all right? After graduating from neurological reorganization, we started neural feedback to help diminish the higher anxiety we were still seeing and some brain irritability. We had seen substantial improvement from both the neurological reorganization and the TAAT, but we knew she was still dealing with higher than typical anxiety that caused her attitude to be prickly. All right? Her rages were now gone. Neurofeedback turned, about, turned out to be a great addition, and it did wonders in helping diminish the anxiety. We still use neurofeedback both for my daughter and for myself. During the five years that we were in active treatment for Bethany's reactive attachment disorder and PTSD, we also attended two of the camps that Nancy Thomas has designed. These were crucial in learning how to gel the therapeutic parenting and supporting our family through this difficult time, especially our older daughter who was really suffering. Reading about therapeutic parenting from a book is one thing, but seeing it in action was a whole different ball game and it was priceless to our family to attend those two family bonding camps. Um, Bethany is a witty and quirky 11 year old. She and her sister spend a good deal of time laughing with each other. Bethany and her dad experienced her sense of humor when they play games. They play with each other quite a bit and they banter back and forth giving each other fun and appropriate smack about who's going to win and by how much. Bethany giggles with me virtually every night over various things such as when I'm reading and I miss a word or change a word just to see if she's paying attention. She smiles and laughs at our dog as she kisses her face or does the silly German Shepherd things that our dog's known to do. 
Bethany giggles with her best friends as they sit in the car and behave like any typical girls. Um, Bethany is kind, caring, and compassionate. She feels sad when her sister has a bad day. There's a picture for her. With her there she is with her dad now. They're so happy together. Very happy dad. He's very proud of his daughter. Look at those eyes. Filled with joy. There she is with her sister. Uh, she feels sad when her sister has a bad day. And she will tell Kendall she's sorry for what's troubling her. She feels sad for animals when they're hurting. She has compassion. She feels sad for her dad. Uh, and I when we're sad or hurting and she feels scared and insecure when we have fallen into bickering she tells us how she is feeling and checks to see if everything's going to be okay she uses her words instead of her actions that's a healthy child she is sparkly her eyes shine with joy most of the time she is a normal child so she does have her moments of sadness self-pity anger and other emotions but where her eyes were once empty or filled with hate her eyes now sparkle with joy and excitement. She gets excited about life and upcoming events rather than sabotaging them, as our children do. <laughs> uh, Bethany has lots of friends at school. Last year, she was voted to be a peer mediator because she is so good in people skills. There's a change. See, all that therapy really does pay off. She is a great student, and I never have to get on her to do her homework. She is respected in the classroom. Bethany finally desires a relationship with her dad. She likes to eat chips and salsa and watch football with him. She likes to go to our local football games with him. Bethany thanks him, thanks him, for making her breakfast each morning before school. She loves and boasts about the fact that she and her daddy both share the same love of bacon. <laughs> when he goes out of town or gets really busy at work and has, some, has less time for home, she misses him and asks to call to talk. She seeks him out for hugs or if she's scared. When we were in Disney World, she chose to ride the scarier rides with him because he was bigger and felt safer with him. But she said, please Bone, don't be offended, Mom. But she knew where she needed the, the most support. All right. Ah, she's with her grandma. <clears throat> this summer, my dad and I took her back to China for 10 days. I was prepared and excited to use this opportunity as an experiment to see where she was in her healing journey. I was a little bit apprehensive, and many times our kids that are ready, ooh, it's bad. Bethany was ready. Here she is with her mother and her grandfather in China. Bethany did beautifully. She shared her feelings, especially in regards to the public toilets. Okay, have you ever been there? They're interesting. She recognized and acknowledged what she has here in the United States and told me she was so happy to live in America. She integrated pieces of herself. Oh, excuse me, my pages are sticking. Both about being Chinese and about being adopted. She came home more at peace with who she is and the family she lives in and I have seen a pride in her about being adopted and about being Chinese that I had not seen previously. Going to China with her was an enjoyable and fascinating experience, and if she had not been as healthy as she is, it would have been miserable and traumatic. She's beautiful inside and out. See those eyes? There's a soft confidence in them. Bethany snuggles with me while we read, when I hug her or when she's sad or sick. She will ask for hugs when she needs them. She will give me sweet, loving hugs when I need them, and I tell her I'm feeling sad and I need a hug. Although sometimes she may need some time alone and away from me to process her feelings and get ready to share them, she quickly and readily comes to me and shares. Each morning she comes into my bathroom for a hug to say good morning. She used to hunt me down each morning and begin my day with a hassle or a rage. But now she comes in either with a cheery smile or a sleepy grin. When I go out with her dad, with Kendall, or by myself, she will pull my bed down, my covers on my bed, lay out my pajamas so it's all ready for bed. Sometimes she even puts toothpaste on my toothbrush. There are times I come home and find the sweetest cards or notes on my pillow that express gratitude and love. She asks if I need help, and then she helps me. 
when she's given chores, she mildly, very mildly, protests about chores, but she does them and she does them correctly. She is fun to be with and I fully enjoy her company, which is not something I could say early on. Did Bethany heal? Yes, she did. This young man's mother sent me a beautiful letter years ago and this picture of him and I called and asked permission to share it with you. So she says, Nancy, thank you so much for all your hard work and dedication to our families. Our family is in a very different place now due in part to our camp experience and your teachings. Eric is a freshman in high school this year. He is in the regular high school and is getting A's and B's. No more rages. No more destruction. He is having regular conversations with the family and is participating in activities and chores. Our lives still have ups and downs, but not extremes. The ups and downs are very much like other 14-year-olds' ups and downs. Thank you, and God bless you. See those eyes? Filled with confidence and peacefulness. Pam Cliffner and her husband Lonnie are just incredible and the work they've done with their children is beautiful. When they first came to our camp, uh, Pam and Lonnie both were like shell-shocked and their um, older son and daughter up there at the top of the screen were also shell-shocked from the rest of the bunch, wearing them down to nothing. But um, Pam writes, in a nutshell, October of 2009, we had the following acronyms for our family of 10. Kids' ages were age 16, 13, 10, 9, 9, 9, 8, and 4. Um, acronyms, we had drug effect of every avenue, ADD, ADHD, PTSD, anxiety disorder, reactive attachment disorder, and three of them. We were already good parents, but exhausted, frustrated, and living by the seat of our pants to contain the flames. We learned so much at camp about healing the whole family, not just the sickness within. Behaviors we were still living through, raging, lying, stealing, anxiety, panic attacks, self-harm, wired brains beyond belief, peeing, pooping, that was just the tip of the iceberg before camp. So we made a list of what we could afford to do and what we could not. We prioritized the options and which kid was the sickest, so we dove in with all feet. Tools we learned and used. Let me see if I've got a list here for you. Um, the book, When Love is Not Enough, the DVD, Mastering Steps, When Love is Not Enough, vitamins and minerals, we went to a homeopathic doctor to work a plan for our entire family, parents included, medical doctor, blood work and check for any deficiencies, neuro reorganization, again that's the crawling exercises, uh, neuro feedback, good attachment therapy, and that's all in caps, okay, respite, support group and a good mentor that was steps ahead of us. The number one priority was and has always been our marriage. Taking care of mom and dad had been neglected. Selected and trained a respite worker, prepared the house, flew in a specialized reactive attachment disorder trained therapist to instruct and guide our local therapist. We did this quarterly. We began neural reorganizational patterns we started neurofeedback after we did a QEEG on each child. That's the brain mapping. Huge help to clarify neuro and eye issues twice a week. Built an awesome fit box for the healthy ones in the family. That's where one of the children's throwing a major raging screamer. All the other children are instructed to go to the fit box and get a prize out of there. There's all kinds of fun puzzles and um, snacks and whatever fun things to do so that they can take them to their room and enjoy those until the child finishes their rage. All right. Set up 7 p.m. bedtime and began routines, vision therapy, and also neurooptometry. Susan Ward is a parent coach and a therapeutic respite provider. She has old ch older child adoption support um, program and uh, she's amazing, very, very skilled. She says, as a single parent, I adopted Hannah from, Rus from a Russian orphanage when she was six years old. She was cute, 
smart and a terror <laughs> hitting kicking breaking and spitting that was always directed at me only me no one else saw what I saw my family wondered why I was so strict with her my girlfriends thought I was making it up every night I cried myself to sleep and asked God to help me through just one more day many of us have been there haven't we each morning I promised myself that if she and I made it through the day alive I deserved a glass of wine I started her in therapy before she was even fluent in English of course it didn't help I took her to a psychiatrist who said it was ADHD which of course it was not eventually I figured out it was reactive attachment disorder then the pieces began to fall into place including finding a rad therapist changing my parenting completely and putting therapeutic respite into place it was hell even after I got the right pieces in place including suffering severe depression for years the one thing that I never let go of was the absolute conviction that she would heal and she did she's now a junior at Duke University she's kind helpful and caring and she loves the Lord it was the hardest most horrible thing I ever lived through and yes it was worth it awesome aren't they beautiful together they look alike ah some of my favorite kiddos all right it's Brooklyn bright eyes and courage she didn't start out like that unfortunately <laughs> okay Brooklyn came home at nine and a half months old from Guatemala she was in a loving foster home and we really felt the chances of attachment issues in RAD were slim little did we know the rages started at two years old when Brooklyn was four years old I learned about Nancy Thomas's program and purchased taming the tiger while it's a kitten I began doing all that was recommended in the book and the raging stopped and Brooklyn for the first time since coming home attached and bonded with me she still had difficulty with other children we did not have a therapist we were working with to help us continue on the healing journey things were manageable but still very stressful when Brooklyn started in the first grade she was in a class with no structure at all and with the issues that were still unresolved she spiraled completely out of control we signed up for a week at uh, camp the family bonding camp with Nancy Thomas it changed our lives Brooklyn was the quote-unquote perfect child at camp she played the victim role very well which our kids do to elicit pity and control people okay when we left camp I took Brooklyn out of school and focused the next year on healing I did all that was recommended at camp and never looked back it has been a long journey and this little girl has endured many losses Oh, there she is at camp getting her blue bandana and she beautiful miss Nancy asked her after camp that first time when she was the only child who did not do the zip line at camp if she wanted to spend her life missing out on the fun I'm thrilled to share this girl does not miss out on the fun anymore my girl is not only having opportunities to have fun she is feeling and living and filled with fun from her heart she has friends she has a heart of gold and a deep level of empathy and compassion for others Brooklyn's healing began with reading Taming the Tiger and then we attended a three-day Nancy Thomas conference when Brooklyn was four at seven we began a deeper level of healing from all we had learned from Nancy Thomas's week-long camp we also met our amazing therapist at camp who for the last two years we have traveled seven hours one way every four weeks to see her and she has been an invaluable person on Brooklyn's healing journey we're blessed to be at camp with one of the people who started the family challenge camp this picture if you're not sure what she's doing there I have this picture actually on my desk I keep it there all the time because she couldn't do the zip line at camp she had too much pain in her heart and too much fear um, after that and her mother committed to taking a year off and completely dedicating herself to saving her daughter she was at a church camp I believe um, with other children and the little girl behind her in line for the zip line was terrified to ride the the rope so to speak Brooklyn said 
I'll go first. You watch me and you'll see. It'll be all right. So here she is, completely free. I call her my little eagle, showing another child who's afraid that courage is going to make it all right. So her heart is touching another child's heart while she's just expressing herself with the freedom that a child should have. It's so beautiful. I love this picture. From the people we have met at Nancy Thomas's camp and the Family Challenge camps, we have had an incredible support system to help us on our healing journey. We will be forever grateful to Nancy and all those who have stepped in the gap when we didn't know what to do. I'm going to leave. I'm going to put this picture up there. Even though this is not the child that I'm talking about in this particular letter, I'm just going to leave it up there because I like this picture. But um, I don't have a picture of this next young girl um, for her privacy because of some of the issues. All right. So her mother shares with us, our daughter Emily was born in China. She spent her days in an orphanage before we adopted her at the age of 11 and a half months. Emily was fiercely independent from the moment she entered our family. She would push away when we tried to hug or snuggle her and was happy playing on her own for hours on end. When we adopted Emily, we had never heard of attachment disorder, but began to suspect something was not quite right as she was growing up. She would get very mad over seemingly minor events and overreact to situations. She had a strong need to always be in control and did not seem to want to show or receive love. Sound familiar? She was a sweetheart to strangers, often hugging clerks in the store or buttering up to waitresses. She also had little self-control at times, particularly in the grocery store where she loved to cartwheel down the aisles no matter how many times we told her not to. This behavioral pattern continued to escalate until she was 14 years old. When Nancy says that these behaviors are set before the child is three years old, ready to explode when they're 15, boy, is she right. As Emily was growing up, we asked our local child and youth program for help. We talked of Emily's background and stated that we thought she had attachment issues. We were told that we were wrong because she was a strong student at school. Because her behaviors had not been identified by her teachers, we were not able to get help for her. And this mom is an amazing, amazing teacher in Canada. Dedicated, highly skilled, very loving. And she, even as a teacher, was turned away by the school when she asked for help. Because her behaviors had not been identified by her teachers, we are not able to get help for her. When Emily was 14 years old, she had her first boyfriend. They play dated on the they playground dated for one week before the boy broke up with her. Emily's behavior went from bad to worse at home. She was sullen and full of rage from morning till night. Three weeks after the boy broke up with her, she took a bottle of pills to school with the intention to commit suicide. One of the kids at school told the teacher and my daughter's life was saved. This began our journey toward healing. I took a leave of absence from my work to spend every waking hour looking for answers for my daughter. She was put on medication by the psychiatrist who treated her in the emergency. The medication only made her tired and did nothing for the mood swings and rages. In trying to keep her safe, I pulled her in close and didn't let her out of my sight. Little did I know that I had already taken the first steps in healing my daughter. Our local adoption support group suggested that I watch Nancy's Mastering Steps DVDs. For the first time in 14 years, I felt someone knew just what I was living through. Several weeks lo later, we attended one of Nancy's camps in Canada. Emily's healing during that camp was dramatic. She told her secrets and learned to love and trust us. We continued the program after camp, placing a mini tramp front and center in our lives. We kept our expectations high and our eyes soft. We were able to find a great therapist that helped Emily work through some of her anger at her birth mother. Emily is now 16 years old. She is growing up to be an amazing young woman. And I can attest to that. She actually volunteered at camp to help me. And I gave her a tough, tough project. And she dove in and put her heart into it many long hours, even late into the night, for the families. She got nothing out of it, but she gave and gave and gave. She's beautiful. 
Emily is empathetic and has a good set of values and morals. She tries hard to do the right thing, which isn't always easy considering the peer pressure she has to deal with. Best of all, she has learned what love is. She is connected to me and trusts that I will keep her safe and love her no matter what. The best times are when she and her brother are sharing a joke. They have a relationship now. She's respectful, responsible, and definitely fun to be around. We laugh together. We cry together. We work together. We play together. We are family. Family I fell in love with this mom at camp, and she's just been on my heart so long. And when uh, she came back to another camp, and I saw the children's eyes, I knew. And she's so proud of them. I asked her to share the story. What an incredible journey we have been on, and how exciting to be on this end looking back. Today I have the family I always dreamed of. I am a single mother of two pretty incredible kids. Marisol is 15 now and Ricky is 13. Our home is usually full of laughter and fun. We love being together and doing things as a family. That isn't the way it always was, as you can tell from the picture here. Seven years ago, two very wounded children came to live with me as my foster children, and two years later, they became my daughter and my son. Their story is a familiar one of abuse, neglect, drug abuse, and alcoholism among the adults. My daughter was very distant when she came to me, but for everyone else, she was a model child. My son couldn't accept touch. He'd yell, ouch, to a hand on his shoulder. Neither of them would accept hugs. They both had fits of rage that would end in holes in the walls and in the doors. My daughter would scream as she sat and pulled handfuls of her hair out and banged her head on the cement floor. They lied and stole everything from food to money to electronics. As they grew older, my daughter's rages became more and more violent. Both kids attempted suicide several times. When Marisol hit middle school, there were sleepless nights. I'd lay awake, worrying about where she was when she had run away. Other nights, I'd lock my son and I in my room to sleep, afraid of what she would do to us in the night. One of the sheriff's deputies listened daily for a call to our address, and he would be the first to respond, sometimes leaving her here after lecturing her, other times sending her in an ambulance because of cuts she had inflicted on herself. Several times he took her away in handcuffs for assaulting me or for stealing. All this time, both kids were in counseling. The counselors would tell me I was too hard, too picky. They needed more freedom. We tried medication, different counselors, family counseling, DBT, you name it. Finally, I stumbled on a mentor from our counseling office who had heard of Nancy Thomas and thought she could get the DVDs to listen to. She believed me when I told her what was happening in our home. Well, let me change our picture here. Oh, there you go. There's some cold eyes. She believed me when I told her what was happening in our home and offered to be a support through the rages. About the same time, my own therapist referred me to an attachment therapist. For the first time, here was a therapist who not only believed me, but affirmed me as being an awesome mom. Wow! But I had to wonder to myself if it was too late. I was so weary and I didn't know if I had the strength. It would take, I didn't know if I had the strength it would take to see this through with my daughter. About a month later, my daughter went to subacute care and then to residential treatment because she was too dangerous to live at home. Hannah, our attachment therapist, encouraged me to use the time she was gone to rest and focus on healing for my son and told us we needed to go to camp in Washington. Through my own research, I found out about neurofeedback and thought it sounded like something that was hopeful. During the 10 months my daughter was away, Ricky and I went to our first camp. It was a turning point for my boy and I. He told me on the way home that if he had to choose camp himself, he probably wouldn't. <laughs> okay. But he thought it was the only thing that had worked for him. We learned about the different way their brains were working and how to help them calm and the role that nutrition played. We learned about neurofeedback and how it could help. And I learned how to parent therapeutically. We left with hope. 
In the meantime, my daughter was still in residential care, continuing to have violent rages and not meeting treatment goals. Every visit with her was more discouraging than the last. I began to advocate for her. You can see this smile. If you look at her eyes, there's anger, but the, the teeth are clenched here. She's getting her picture taken, so she's supposed to show her teeth, but there's no smile in her eyes. Okay? Every visit with her was more discouraging than the last. I began to advocate for her to receive neurofeedback, but was met with resistance. Finally, they agreed to let me take her from the facility to get the treatments for the neurofeedback. So much, let's see, whoops, after the first lens treatment, that's a kind of neurofeedback, she began to change after the first one. Nice. She, so much change, so much change that after the first month of lens treatments, she was able to come home, and two weeks later, all three of us went to another camp with Nancy and the flight check crew. My daughter still had a few rages left in her, and we all learned not to be afraid of them. Nancy gave me a new perspective so I could meet them head on. The more confident I was, the more confident my daughter became, and the safer Ricky felt. Today, None of us can remember the last time Marisol hit anyone or the last time Ricky put a hole in the wall. Today, my children's eyes sparkle with love for each other. Let me change the picture here. Whoops. That was when Ricky had gotten some help, but her daughter had not. One up and one down. Here we go. Here's today. Today, none of us can remember the last time we had violence. My children's eyes sparkle with love for each other and love for me their mom. Yelling and screaming has been replaced with laughter. Assault and self-harm have been replaced with hugs. Flat and lifeless eyes have been replaced with eyes that shine with love and compassion. Is there hope? Yes. Can a child with diagnosis of reactive attachment disorder heal? You bet they can. You can take it from this grateful mom. My mission is to give hope to those who feel hopeless as I did once. Yes, we did the work, but the work was so much more productive once we had the tools. For that, I will forever be grateful. Hugs. Aren't they beautiful? I think they even look alike. She is an amazing, amazing mom. Some lucky children that have been blessed with a mom like that. Ah, uh, this is from another awesome mom that I love dearly. This is in the orphanage in Guatemala, and he is actually clawing at the eyes of the orphanage worker and raging. Mom writes, when we adopted our son Leo at the age of three years old, we, like many other families, expected a few minor challenges, but thought and had been told that because our child was so young, that life would continue, continue on much as it had before he joined our family. We thought that if we provided a safe and loving home, he would eventually thrive. We were completely unprepared for the extreme behaviors that we started to observe from our child. Some of his behaviors were nonstop chatter, acting incapable to the point of regularly acting like he didn't even know what a cow was, superficially charming to anyone but mom, loud extreme tantrums that last for hours, up to three and a half hours. During these tantrums, he would attack me, our younger son, or would shred the house. He would strip naked when he would get stressed or angry and would try to run away. He would run out into traffic. He would throw rocks, bricks, or anything handy at people or property. He would get out of his seat in the car and start throwing things while I was driving, or he would attack us while we were driving. He would urinate on things in anger. He had unclear speech patterns and was almost incomprehensible for the first two years with us. He had no respect for women. He acted out sexually. He was hypervigilant, controlling, scratching, biting, hitting, and spitting. The list could actually go on for pages. Life had gotten very difficult for us, to say the least. Whew, there he is. Um, we sought out help for Leo within the first six months of him coming home, but we were given the same incorrect diagnosis and bad advice as so many other families of children with attachment disorder. We were told that he had ADD and he was developmentally delayed and that he needed speech therapy. 
They urged us to enroll him in a therapeutic preschool that was run by our local school district. We did what they suggested. It was a disaster. He actually got worse, if you can imagine. And looking at him here, before he went to school, worse was not good. When I would pick him up from school, he would scream and act like he was terrified to go home with me. We pulled him out of school after a month because it was clearly not helping him. For a year and a half after that, we struggled and hoped that all of our friends advised that all kids go through this and he'll grow out of it was true. Then things began to change. We found Nancy Thomas's website. When we read the list of symptoms for reactive attachment disorder and saw that Leo had many of them, we finally had an explanation as to why Leo would rage for hours and pee on his brother's teddy bear. He wasn't attached to us at all, even after two years of living with us. I took Leo to family bonding camp in Tennessee while my husband Hank stayed home with our little guy and ran our business. The day we flew to camp was one of the most difficult and humiliating times of my life. He screamed, bit, kicked, and spit through two airports. At camp during that week, I saw tremendous changes in our son. My husband spoke to him on the phone that week and said, that's not our son, he sounds like a different kid. Camp was the start of healing for Leo. This picture, mom's carrying in the pouch, she's doing the Taming the Tiger program. She is such an incredible mom. She weighs about 100 pounds. He weighed 50 pounds and she carried him for six weeks. There are tears here, which normally is not a good thing, but it was the first time Leo was sad and he cried and he clung to his mother. So he's allowing his mother to comfort him for the first time. And it was a powerful time, a powerful moment for mother and son. Once we returned home from camp, we began to implement the therapeutic parenting techniques. I also began to implement the Taming the Tiger program. And we do this usually with children four and under, sometimes four and a half, all right? I carried Leo, who was 45 pounds at the time. Well, she carried him until he was 50 pounds. Um, he was a little bit on the older side for the program, but it helped him tremendously to get regulated. When I would feel him get tense, I would bounce him and put his head against my heart. Fortunately, we lived within a half an hour of Nancy's ranch, so she began doing um, all the help she could with us. And at that same time, James Dumenil, a skilled, experienced, and a qualified attachment therapist, began doing therapy with our family and Leo. There is no doubt in my mind that it was the combination of identifying the problem, education, implementing the techniques, having good attachment therapy and respite, giving independence in tiny baby steps, and taking care of ourselves that were all essential elements for Leo's success. In this picture, she pointed out to me that she's sitting there on the beach. She wants to build a sand castle with her son, Leo. She's reaching for him and encouraging him to come and play with her. And he's got his jaw very rigid and he's moving away. We can look back now, four years later, and feel that all of the struggles were worth it. Leo has healed. People ask me, how do you know that he's healed? I tell them that I first really started to believe that he was attaching was when I went to tuck him in one night. I had been gone for the day. His light was off and I thought he was asleep. He said, Mom, could you please turn on the light? I want to see your face. When I heard that precious statement come from the mouth of the boy who had once said that I want to cut you up into pieces so you can't be with Jesus, I knew that he was healing. Now I truly know because of countless reasons I don't have to worry about what he's going to do or whether he's going to be disruptive. He is the same person wherever he goes. He no longer wants to manipulate people to get what he wants. He has friends. He cares about his family and he is reciprocal. He has a conscience and he feels bad when he does something wrong. It's beautiful. I lost my place. I'm sorry. He loves us. He thinks about how others feel and wants to do what's right. He has asked Jesus into his heart. 
People say I have an amazing sun and I don't scowl. I smile and I say thank you. We are blessed. I feel like myself again. Living with the stress of his behaviors had been changing me. He is nothing like the sensitive, gentle, generous, thoughtful little ray of sunshine and laughter that we have now. These past couple of years we have watched Leo become more than we ever imagined he could be. He is a wonderful son and a wonderful brother. He is a good example for other children wherever he goes. He is socially appropriate. He plays baseball and soccer. Mom is a runner and he runs as well and he's an award-winning runner. It's a beautiful happy family. He's an incredible athlete. He's a gifted runner who has placed first and second in 5K events. When our children have their heart healthy, they can put their heart into whatever project they want to, and Leo puts his heart into his athletics. He won an art contest at school and has his self-portrait framed at the entrance to the main office for the first whole month of school. His grades have gone from Ds and Fs to As, Bs, and Cs. One of his classmates came up to me last year, took my hand, and said, Leo is so nice to everyone. I never imagined that any of these things were possible a few years ago when I would cry by myself in the bathroom or when I would resent what my life was like. He had his first real birthday party with friends. He feels good about himself. Now we actually enjoy our son. I am proud to be his mother. Our son made it and your child can too. I encourage all of you who have children who are struggling to build a support system for your family. It really does take a village to help kids from the hard places to heal. Take care of yourselves. If you do not, the process will take much longer. Work on any issues that you have within yourself or your marriage. Take care of the healthy kids in the household. Delegate anything you can to other friends or family for the first few months and then hibernate with your child. Hire a good attachment therapist, hire a respite provider or train one. Never stop praying and believing. Take any steps toward independence very slowly. Our journey has inspired me to write several therapeutic children's books for children with behavioral issues and their families. One of these books was written by my son Leo and I. It's entitled, I'm Over It. The book is about a young boy's journey through healing. And as soon as they get that all put together, we're going to be carrying it in our store because I think it's something everybody should have and I'm really excited looking forward to it. Many of the children who are struggling have no idea that they can overcome this life. It is written for children so that they have hope that they can heal we hope to have it available soon, and we will be carrying that one, so keep an eye on our store. Look at that happy family. Awesome. Oh, my goodness. So much pain. So much pain that our little ones suffer with before they come to us. Those eyes are filled with overwhelming pain. This mom writes about her son. Can children with RAD heal? I've been traveling this healing road as a single mom for 17 years. I have three wonderful children, two of whom I adopted separately from the foster care system. I was introduced to Nancy Thomas when she taught at the YOM School of Counseling and Healthcare 13 years ago in Hawaii. The wealth of information and resources that Nancy has provided have been an answer to my prayers. I believe that the team approach which Nancy recommends including therapeutic parenting, attachment therapy and trained respite support form the foundation for healing. I'm a firm believer that our Heavenly Father, the best father my children could ever have, is the ultimate healer. I agree 100%. There have been many ups and downs on this road, highs and lows, progress and setbacks, celebrations and tears. So much healing has taken place. When we sit at the dinner table, my family sometimes talk about their past and the pain and suffering they experienced in their early years. We talk about how strong their hearts are now and I choose to be mindful of and thankful for our blessings. I continue to parent them at their emotional, developmental age, which is what works best for all of us. 
I keep them close. We are a close-knit family and we work well as a family team. I am so grateful to see the joyful light they have in their eyes now. Their kindness and respect toward me and others blesses my heart. Their compassion and their empathy, their desire to do the right thing, to make the right choices, their desire to help others. I cherish the bond we have now as a family, the way we work as a team. I am so proud of all of my children. My oldest son has been such a strong support, strong part of the team. He has always provided support and mentoring for his adopted siblings as they have grown and healed. There are a couple of specific things to come to mind that have been important for me as a single mom. I think it's enormously important to have a few people in your life that really understand what you're going through. Some of your closest friends and family will not fully understand. You need a couple people that have seen it, done it, get it. Also, a good attachment therapist is so important, like James Dumanil. I have worked with three wonderful therapists over the years that have all been available for phone appointments, to provide the advice, the tools needed while we're going through things. Sometimes it's just too hard to get to a therapy appointment, and sometimes some of the work needs to be done in the home by the parent with the therapist guiding. And there will be setbacks and moments where it feels like all the progress you thought was happening was a lie. And you feel lost and disappointment because of choices the kids made and things you've suddenly discovered have been going on. Let yourself feel the loss. But don't sink into that place where you feel like it will never get better because it's all part of the process. I feel it's super important to speak the word of God over our kids and our families. The Bible is the living word. There are incredible promises for our lives and our futures in there. Lastly, as Deborah Haig has said, we can only do the best we can do. Let's not beat ourselves up if we make a mistake and let's not beat ourselves up if our child makes the wrong choices. For sure. So this little guy is this amazing mom's son and he writes, my name is Noah and I am 20 years old. I myself am a living example of someone who has healed from rat. When I was three and a half, I went into foster care and met my mom for the first time. Later, my mom adopted me. As I lived the life of a kid with rad, I had many ups and downs, mostly downs. I was scared and more protective of myself more often than I was happy. I would cling to my new mom whenever I saw a car or something that reminded me of my past and I would hide at the mere thought of something from my past. I would have what we would call big mats a lot and I had to go to the hospital three times. As I got older and with the love of my family and the feeling of being loved and cared for, I slowly but surely began to heal change the picture here. That's such a sad one. Oh, look at those bright eyes. He's beautiful. I slowly began to heal. I would still have a few big mads here and there, but it was not as frequent as my heart got stronger. As I got older, I finally took notice of the fact that I was thinking a lot more about my decisions and choices and consequences before I took action. I felt less and less mad and scared, skeptical and agitated. I've healed more and more for the past few years and I have worked as an assistant and mentor for a tribal youth program and also a camp counselor for two church groups. Oh, he's so beautiful. I want to show other kids that even if they've gone through rough things, they can heal. There is hope. I am truly blessed, happy, and fortunate to stand here, a boy, now a young man, who through some of his own choice making with God's help, is free from rad. I truly love my family, and I laugh with them, and we hang out. My older brother and I really are close, and we do things together. I try to live my life according to the word of God, and God is always there for me and guides me. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 
beautiful. Oh, oh, here's his sister. My name is Taylor, and I'm 17, and I'm horse crazy. You may ask, is it possible for kids with Rad to heal? Well, I'm going to tell you, definitely. And I'm proof. Does it take a while? Yes, it does, but it is a process. We can't go from self-preservation to dependence and love for family in one moment. I went into foster care when I was four and was adopted when I was six by my foster mom. I was blessed to be in a wonderful Christian home where I learned about God's unconditional love as well as the love of a family. The sad little face. This was hanging on her cubby in her school, in her little preschool. I used to be mean to animals. But now I am the owner of a beautiful horse who loves me and trusts me. I am also considering becoming a veterinarian. When I was in preschool, my teachers thought I was deaf because I did not speak. I didn't speak because I was afraid to. In the past, I had been silenced one way or another. Before I knew it was safe to speak, I play acted, and I knew I would be listened to and understood. Now I'm shy at first. But find a topic I know about and the top switch is turned on. <laughs> I can relate to what Beth Thomas has said about kids making the right choices and then going back to the old ways again because it feels weird. I've been there. But now I make the right choices. Once in a while there's a toss up whether to do it right or wrong and sometimes I still mess up. But in the end I strive to do what's right. It's a process of start and stop because you start and then you stop. Once the healing starts though, the only way the healing will stop completely is if you stop it. We can't do it on our own. We need help along the way. The sparkling nose eyes, and she gorgeous? Awesome mom. Oh, this is little Steven. So much fear and sadness in those little eyes. His amazing mom, Adriana. <laughs> I fell in love with her at camp few years back and she's gotten to be a very dear friend of mine and watching Stephen heal has just filled my heart he's so wonderful and so strong now but she shares with us um, let me see here I need my glasses is what we need here we adopted Stephen from China he had been in an orphanage for two and a half months where he nearly starved to death as they had to spoon feed him milk due to his cleft palate and the fact that they had no special bottles to feed him he was rescued and placed in Mother's Love Orphanage in Nanning with Kit Ying. Kit Ying has been, um, actually I've done training in China for eight years, and Kit Ying has been in a number of my trainings. She's an amazing, amazing lady doing wonderful work over there. Um, Stephen was there for 10 months, and he received his lip repair surgery and was then placed in foster care. So he had quite a few moves and medical trauma as well as a lot of hunger. He was anxiously attached to his foster mother, clingy and scared. He literally shut down when we got him. He made no eye contact or looked away or straight through us as though we didn't exist when we tried to engage him. That changed drastically after the Colorado camp in 2008. He now asks us to look at him when he talks to us so that he is sure we are listening. He's asking for the eye contact. That's a good thing. He made it clear when he wanted or didn't like something, he wouldn't. He would scream for an hour and 45 minutes. We timed it. I would hold him to calm him down. It was exhausting. We later used emotional processing as well as cranial sacral therapy and massage therapy to release some of his body trauma and early anger. After therapy and two camps, he has only shown just a little anxiety. He can now verbalize and express his fears, pains, and anxiety through the use of words. Stephen has had a lot of medical dental trauma and used to completely fall apart before he would have to go to the doctors. He's been cry he would be crying and shaking before we even got there. It would take several of us to hold him down to examine him. He also used to have terrible night terrors and he had a lot of things to fill his mind with with those. After EMDR sessions, he, was, he has really calmed down quite a bit. He can now be calm during exams and procedures. He has had 12 surgeries to date. He just had eight teeth removed and handled it very well. Upon his arrival at our home at three years and nine months, get a little picture going on here, 
He would throw toys with great accuracy and force at others, causing injury. He would bite, claw, and scratch if he wasn't getting his way. He's a lot kinder now and mostly throws pillows at his siblings in fun. He had all kinds of food issues. It was a daily battle at meals. Um, he no longer makes gross, disgusting noises, comments, or eats with terrible table manners. He even asked if I remind him about something. Would this get me flight checked at camp? <laughs> if I say yes, he immediately fixes the situation. When he has little, when he was little, he would pee in his closet in his room. We'd make him scrub the carpet as a consequence. He figured that out and began peeing in a garbage can in his room and hiding it. He's been using the restroom and toilet properly for a long time now. He'd color on the walls, steal candy and food, hoard food in his room, under his bed. Um, he'd get bothers if others moved anything in his room because he likes it immaculate now. He knows how to clean a bedroom A+. He used to smash his new toys. If anything angered him, he'd punish himself severely. He's meticulous now about his belongings, and he actually saved his money and bought his very own nice camera, an iPod, and a bunch of Kinects. He is very careful with his cello that cost $4,500, and he even gets upset if the tiniest little scratch is anywhere there. His speech uh, was obviously very delayed. He had facial flat affect. He didn't use his facial expressions. And now he speaks clearly. Um, he was superficially engaging and charming with this fake rad smile that people would fall for. He doesn't do that anymore. His face is very natural with a relaxed smile. He has a great sense of humor. He attends our private lessons weekly two-hour rehearsal with the Lyceum Chamber Orchestra voted the best youth orchestra in the state of Utah. He set his own goals to practice for at least an out oh, two hours a day with his cello and an extra hour a day for his math because he was struggling with some math issues. He has a happy heart. He loves his mother. He loves himself. He knows God loves him and has given him all these incredible talents. I was blessed to hear him play his cello. He plays his music from his heart and it pours out of him. He's an incredible young man. He's in scouts. He gets all kinds of awards there. Stephen. The animals love him. He's gentle. Zach is a birth child. His mother is, again, one of my dearest friends. I just fell in love with her heart. Zach was born to a happy couple after a healthy pregnancy and four days of active labor. He nursed immediately, slept well, and grew well. In a few months, if he wanted to get somewhere, he aimed and he rolled. He army crawled for only two weeks, was on his hands and knees for two more, pulled himself up and walked at six months. Okay, something's wrong. We were very proud. His favorite thing to do was to spin around on his hands and knees. He wouldn't sleep alone, so at nine months he was climbing out of his crib to sleep with us. No technique helped him to sleep without me. He was fearless and full of antics. At 18 months he climbed on the roof to watch me garden. He never cried much, and when he fell he would just get up and go on. When his baby sister was born, he loved her dearly and would cuddle her, bring her his favorite toys, and yank on her arms and legs and run and jump on her. I'm from a family of girls. Even though I was educated in psychology and early childhood education, I thought and was told, he's just being a boy. Then at three, this happy, easygoing boy changed drastically. He raged. He kicked the animals he loved. He wouldn't sit in a car seat without screaming the whole time. He hated wearing clothes that weren't pre-worn to threadbare softness. He bit, he kicked, he scratched, head-butted, and hel when held, actually cracking mom's front teeth. What happened to my sweet boy? So we started our journey. For three years I read, took him places, and made sure he had a lot of active play. We started him on meds against every cell in my body, but when he came to me at four and said, Look, Mom, this is the first time I finished a picture, it struck me that he had been battling himself more than any battle I had fought for him. We did an extensive diet change. I found Doris Rapp's book, Is This Your Child?, and did the elimination allergy diet. We did this together for six weeks. What a change. 
In conclusion, after adding back and testing, he could not have chocolate, corn syrup, apple juice, and red dye without going completely bonkers. This helped for a couple years, but he still looked very sick. Big dark circles under his eyes, and when he was six, the rages and weird behaviors turned with a vengeance. I spent hours holding him to keep him and others in the house safe. I had to change my parenting. I didn't, I didn't want to. I had dreamed of being a mom all my life. I had two baby girls that I wanted to raise with a gentle compassion. But my boy needed structure, tight boundaries, immediate intervention with the slightest challenge. How could I be two types of mom? I couldn't. I finally realized that the intensive parenting that my son needed is also just what my daughters needed as they had lived in this chaotic environment as well. I resigned from my work as a paramedic to stay home. This was going to take some intensive work. Daily life improved. Later when I met Nancy Thomas and realized how similar we approached things, I realized that my kids, including my older adopted daughter, who was rad, had taught me how to parent these anxious, explosive kids and their siblings. I also heard of neurological reorganization. This is done with a functional neuro eval and then prescribed exercises. Zach did these exercises for a year and a half. Motivation was tough, but we started to see big changes. He had read at four, then stopped at six. He was in the third grade by now and not reading. In the eval, we learned that his eyes were never in the same place at once. No wonder. He also felt little pain. If he didn't feel it, how was he to know that others did? He began to read. He began to show compassion. He hadn't related to anyone but me, well, for years, especially the pets. One morning I went to wake him and he was asleep cuddling with a dog. Bit by bit, my boy came back to me. It wasn't easy. Our friends were uncomfortable letting their kids play with him. He would pee out the window when the neighbor man emptied his garbage. He cussed and screamed when he was mad, even though he had never lived in that environment. He got in trouble at school because he would play so rough. Then in middle school, he began getting depressed. He didn't understand the other kids. They didn't understand him. He still couldn't take pressure in relationships without getting explosive. But he and we kept on. All children need present parents, but this one needed sometimes minute by minute intuitive, intense involvement. We did this for years. There were ups and downs. Zach rejoined gymnastics. He had tried earlier and couldn't stay with the group. He started to play the saxophone. He got good grades. His inner pain was still a problem. Some days he just didn't want to cope, but he went for it. He joined the marching band. He had friends. Then he got a scholarship to his college of choice, the one he wanted. He got a job. He met the love of his life. He's actually engaged to be married now. He still has challenges, unexplained, unwanted mood swings, but he is living the life he has chosen well. His faith is at the center of his life. He changed his major from music performance to child and family studies. He wants to help kids and families struggling with severe emotional behavior issues. Last summer he worked full time as a camp counselor. People were amazed at his compassion and skill with the difficult kids. He staffs at the Oregon Nancy Thomas camps now. He encourages both kids and parents with his understanding of what it really is like on both sides. He is the son I always dreamed of. We just didn't get here the way I thought we would. Many times we're asked why we didn't quit or send him away. We didn't quit or send him away. And now they have the son they always dreamed of. And he is beautiful on the inside and on the outside. Can our children with Rad heal? Yes. Thank you for listening. Someday. Your children will thank you for investing this time too. Hang in there. It's a roller coaster of healing. Ups and downs. They get better and then they slide back to the old behaviors and they get better. But the roller coaster has left the station. And as long as that thing's rolling forward, they're on the roll. So they need your heart. They need your soft eyes. They need lots of hugs, even when they're hard to hug because they're doing their porcupine stuff. But they can heal. Thank you for what you're doing for the children. Bye-bye.